I just think we're living in a day and age right now where people need hope. People need to know the grace of God. People wonder over and over again, what's the message of Jesus? It's really simple. Jesus Christ, he did not come for the healthy. He came for the sick. He did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today's guests express how their relationships, through joys and tears, have stood the test of time because of an unwavering commitment to God and the ones they love. And as they've learned what keeps a relationship strong, they have dedicated their lives to share this message with others. Pastor Rich Wilkerson Jr. and entertainers David and Tamala Mann. First up, Rich Wilkerson Jr. is the pastor at VU Church in Miami, Florida. Rich descends from four generations of pastors on both sides of his family, including David Wilkerson, the writer of the classic Christian book, The Cross and the Switchblade. Today, Rich tells us how he forged his own way in ministry amidst his family's rich legacy and about his latest book, Friend of Sinners, Why Jesus Cares More About Relationship Than About Perfection. He also opens up on the painful struggle he and his wife endured in their young marriage that lasted nearly a decade. My name is Rich Wilkerson Jr. and I lead VU Church in Miami, Florida with my wife, Dawn Cherie. Uh, VU Church is a new church plant, just three years old, and it's really in the heart of Miami. VU is just short for rendezvous. People always ask us, what does VU mean? Is that even a real church name? Rendezvous means the meeting place. But we quickly discovered that people had a hard time spelling the word and Googling the word. Nobody liked the websites that came up, so we just go by VU Church. And uh, it's been just an amazing, amazing three years uh, getting to see people's lives change and transformed by the message of Jesus. And it's been so cool to just watch God's faithfulness over the last three years as we've seen thousands and thousands of people actually give their life to Jesus. I grew up in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, I was born to uh, pastors for parents. In fact, my dad was an evangelist, but I'm four generations pastor on both sides of my family. I always joke around that my first slow dance was to our God is an awesome God. And in 1998, uh, growing up in Tacoma, Washington, in my grandfather's church, my dad felt really led to come and move to Miami, where he took over a small urban inner city church. And so it was a huge journey for my brothers and I. As we moved, I was 14 years of age, entering into high school, moving from Tacoma all the way to Miami. I think looking back now, it's always easier to connect the dots looking back than it is when you're looking forward. That my dad got a word from the Lord and he stepped out in faith. And now today, I'm reaping the benefits of his faithful decision. You know, I'm really grateful for the family that I grew up in. Sometimes when you're 14 years of age, you have a hard time seeing the good or seeing the beauty in it. But now at 34 years of age, I look back and I'm so thankful for the way that I was raised. I was raised with convictions and I was raised um, with faithful people all around me that took a risk, that stepped out. I learned quickly that being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that you're living your life for convenience, but rather you're living your life for conviction. And so now at 34, I'm just thankful for the heritage. And I know that so many things that are happening in my life is because I had to stand on the shoulders really of giants in the faith that have gone before me. Uh, my uncle David Wilkerson, really he's my second cousin. My dad and him are first cousins. But he's always been a hero to me. I remember as a young age watching the movie The Cross and the Switchblade as Pat Boone <laughs> portrayed and was the character of David Wilkerson. And as a young kid, I had this hero in my life of going, wow, that's what it looks like to step out full of faith, not to live in fear, not to back down to risk or to even areas that you might be afraid in as he stepped up to the gang members and as he stepped up in a time in New York City that was known for drug and known for prostitution and known for really a dangerous time, he stood full of faith. And I think for me, the way it played a part in my life is that from a young age, I was always very, very sensitive towards God. I, I knew I loved God and I, I did know that God loved me. I just don't think I was always sure how I fit in. I didn't really see how I was gonna play my part. But at 17 years of age, I just had a God encounter. I was in Australia, Adelaide, Australia. And I can't remember who was preaching, but I was with my dad and we were at a conference. And it wasn't a big emotional moment. It was more like a conscious decision that I just felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me saying, how long are you gonna run from your calling? And I think stepping out 
as I began to do that, more and more, I think the Lord was just speaking to me that you can be you, and you can be uniquely you. You don't have to do it just like those that went before you. And so quickly, I think what began to transition in my life is rather than feeling the shadow effect, rather than feeling the weight or the burden of those that have gone before me, instead, I think my heart turned to gratitude, that I was thankful for all the examples, for all the mentors, for all the voices uh, of what it looked like to walk out the faith journey. And so while God's given me all these great references, I think because of the love of Jesus, I've discovered my identity in it. And I don't have to do it like my dad. I don't have to do it just like my grandfather. I don't have to do it just like my uncle David Wilkerson. I can do it uniquely the way that he's called me to do it. And for me, that's been so so freeing that now I don't feel the burden of being like them, but rather I feel the gratitude for exactly who they are. So after Don Shree and I had been married for about three or four years, I remember Don Shree was her 25th birthday, we had started talking about the fact that we wanted to start a family. It just seemed like the natural thing to do. It was in our heart. We both come from big families. Don Shree's one of seven kids. I'm one of four boys. So we've always wanted to have a family. But on her, 24th, uh, on her 25th birthday, she went to the doctor to discover that she had a condition known as PCOS, and it was going to make it very difficult for her to conceive. And so we began the journey of talking with doctors and going to specialists. And eight years into the journey is really how long it took us. Uh, but somewhere on that journey, we decided that we wanted to go public with it. And it was really Dawn Shree that was led. I think that for her, being the woman, it was a little bit more of a challenging thing to talk about. But I think about three years into the journey of not being able to have kids, she felt like it was her, really it was her opportunity to share from the valley, if you will. I think so often in church, we're so good at talking about things after the miracle happens. I think we need some more people to be open when they're actually in the midst of pain. You know, I learned so much about God in that season of hoping to have a child. Today, I stand on the other side of it where God did answer our request. After an eight year struggle of trying to have kids, God is so gracious and so faithful that he gave us our firstborn son. His name is Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson. Wyatt means brave, so I call him my brave boy. But now when I look back, I, I wouldn't remove any of that struggle. That struggle is what makes the story so good. And many times, all of us, we only know of God on the mountaintop but I know God in the valley, that he's not just the God of your triumph, but he's also the God of your trial. And many times we don't allow ourselves to be honest with God in our pain, in our worry, in our fear, to ever discover that he's actually right there with us. It's so easy to go around to certain scenes that are really full of heartache and heartbreak, devastation and poverty and go, where is God? The answer is he's right there. He doesn't leave us, he doesn't forsake us. I think when it comes to God, there are certain things that you can't learn on the mountaintop. You actually have to learn it in the valley. I think the greatest lesson that Don Shree and I learned is that a waiting season doesn't have to be a wasted season. That wherever you're at today, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, if you'll lean into relationship with Jesus, he'll speak to you. He'll reveal things to you about his character, about his nature. And sometimes we get into these moments where we go, I just want to throw it away. Just the pain is too bad. The heartache is too bad. But the Bible says in James that we're to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when we face trials of many kinds. Why? It's because that trial is developing something in us, a newfound character, a perseverance that has to be strengthened. And the only way for it to be strengthened is through struggle. For Don Shree and I, I think it brought us closer together. It forced us to have real conversations. It forced us to actually talk about where we were at. I'm not acting like it was easy. There was lots of tears. There was days of doubt. There was worry. There was bad days. But we decided that we were going to grow closer to Jesus in it, and we were going to grow closer as a couple. That's what storms sort of do. Storms either have a way of pushing you away from God, or you can choose to allow your storm to push you towards God. I love that story in Matthew 14 where they're in the middle of a storm, and Jesus walks out on the water. They think it's a ghost. But there's one guy in the boat, his name's Peter, and he thinks it's Jesus. And so he's like, if that's really you, Jesus, tell me to come to you. And Jesus just says one word. He says, come. Peter steps out of the boat, walks on water toward Jesus. That one word, come, is I think the message of the gospel, that whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, 
Maybe it's infertility. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's the loss of a job. Maybe it's a broken heart. Maybe it's betrayal. I don't know what the fill in the blank is, but Jesus would say to all of us, just come. Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy burden, and I will give you rest. And unless I had gone through the eight years of infertility, I could preach to you about rest, but now I can actually testify that I've been in a moment where I needed Jesus to show up and he is faithful to his promise that if we'll come to him, he provides rest for us. And I think the enemy wants to tempt us that when we're going through a tough time just to discard it, to kind of hit the click button and just try to pass through it. But I'm telling you, there's something powerful about these seasons that if we'll lean into them, the breaking and the crushing, it produces something new in us. And I can honestly testify that we serve the God who walks through everything with us, that when we walk through the rivers, they will not pass over us. When we walk through the water, it will not sweep over us. When we walk through the fire, we will not be burned. He's the God who goes before, behind, and around. You know, I grew up in a really amazing home with faithful parents, faithful grandparents that really did teach me the Bible and taught me about God. Yet I think at a young age, uh, I started to view God oftentimes as somebody up in heaven who was maybe angry at me or if I did something wrong, he was gonna let me know that I was wrong. Maybe the picture that I had developed, not necessarily sure how that all the way happened, was kind of like God was like Santa, who's got a nice list and a naughty list. And I think it's really important the way that you view God because ultimately the way that you view God is gonna dictate how you receive and communicate with God. And it wasn't until I was much older that I began to really discover who Jesus was. And I think in discovering who Jesus was, it's fully shifted my paradigm of who God is, that God is a loving Father, that He's not behind the bush waiting and watching as you make a mistake to punish you, but rather He's there that when you do make a mistake, he wants to pick you back up. There's just something about him that has this pull. Everyone wanted to be around him. There's something about his life, the way that he spoke, the way that he talked, the way that he lived, that everybody, they were so intrigued and they felt so welcomed by him. So it shouldn't really be that much of a surprise that when a devotional is written that's coming from the voice of God, it's coming from the voice of Jesus, that people, whether or not they're in church or whether or not they actually affiliate themselves as being quote unquote a Christian, that they would resonate with it. Jesus calling devotional September 5th. I am your best friend as well as your king. Walk hand in hand with me through your life. Together we will face whatever each day brings, pleasures, Hardships, adventures, disappointments, nothing is wasted when it's shared with me. I can bring beauty out of the ashes of lost dreams. I can glean joy out of sorrow, peace out of adversity. Only a friend who is also the king of kings could accomplish this divine alchemy. There is no other like me. The friendship I offer you is practical and down to earth yet it is saturated with heavenly glory. Living in my presence means living in two realms simultaneously, the visible world and unseen, eternal reality. I have equipped you to stay conscious of me while walking along dusty, earthbound paths. And so I, for one, am really thankful for the resource that it is because not only has it ministered to me personally, but it's also been such a resource that I've been able to give to others that are new on the journey or maybe even outside of our church. And I see it as a weapon that as people start to read it, they start to get to know the heart of God, but they also begin to discover their identity of who God's called them to be. And I'm just thankful for all that Jesus Calling is doing and for what it means to so many people. Jesus had a lot of nicknames. Nicknames, we kind of get them based upon other people's perception typically. It's interesting to me that when they nicknamed Jesus, they nicknamed him the friend of sinners. That he was obviously doing life with people, that those that are quote unquote religious or perfect or godlike, they thought that those people did not belong around him. Yet I love that nickname because that nickname is so welcoming to me that I belong with Jesus. That Jesus says, hey, you belong before you believe. Jesus was the guy who was actually at dinner with people. He sat in long conversations. He was not looking at the outside. He was trying to get to the inside. 
So my new book is called Friend of Sinners, Why Jesus Cares More About Relationship Than Perfection. And when I started writing this book, I was thinking about all of my friends who sort of had this misconception of God, that they think that God is not for them, or they think that God is irrelevant, or they think God is mad at them. And I wrote Friend of Sinners because I want people to hear the truth, that the gospel is good news, that God is not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. And when I think about Jesus calling, I mean, this is what this devotion is all about. It's about conveying over and over again the grace of God, that God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Jesus Christ, he is the friend of sinners. He didn't come for perfect people. He came for a relationship with all people. So God never loved me or chose me because I was good enough or because I was righteous enough. He simply loved me because he is love. And over and over again, even at 34 years of age, I have to remind myself of that. You can find Rich's new book, Friend of Sinners, at your favorite book retailer today. Stay tuned for our conversation with actors and singers David and Tamala Mann after a brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Are you looking for a way to keep track of your daily prayers along with Jesus Calling? The Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar goes right along with your daily readings from Jesus Calling. Each day begins with a guided reflection, followed by a space for you to fill in your prayers of thanksgiving and special requests. You can get your free Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar by visiting jesuscalling.com offers. Visit jesuscalling.com offers to download your free family prayer calendar today. Our next guests are actors and singers David and Tamala Mann. Full of talent, wit, and love for each other, David and Tamala have been a force in the entertainment industry for nearly 30 years. After touring with the award-winning gospel group Kirk Franklin and the Family, David and Tamala found fame when they met producer and playwright Tyler Perry. Since then, David and Tamala have gone on to star in movies, television series, their own reality show, and Tamala has launched a Grammy award-winning recording career of her own. Through it all, they've been honest with their highs and lows so they can bring hope to their millions of fans, which they've written about in their book, Us Against the World. I am Tamala Mann. I am a singer. First of all, I'm a mother, wife. I'm a singer, songwriter, actress. Um, I kind of, I'm like a jack of all trades. I have a lot of jobs. You're a jaquita of all trades. A jaquita of yeah. all trades. <laughs> you can't be jack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'm David Mann. I'm a believer. Mm -hmm. I'm a husband. Yes. I'm a grandfather. I'm a grandmother. I didn't yeah, put that yeah, in there. Maybe you're not a grandmother. I am. I'm a do grand. I look like, do I look like I'm a grandmother? Not at all. Okay. No. Go ahead. I'm a, um, like I say, I'm a grandfather, producer, and uh, I love this chick right here. Oh, you're trying to get brownie points. I'm the youngest of 14. I'm the only one that graduated from high school out of my bunch. Actually, my mother was a believer, and we did a lot of church. The only activities mostly that I was able to attend, they were all surrounded by church. So it was like, and I started singing at eight years old, and singing is like now. It's like I feel the same way I did then now, and I love it. I'm the second oldest of five, five boys. Uh, I was born in Lubbock, Texas, in a little small, small city in Lubbock. Believe it or not, I know people are gonna find it hard to believe, but at one time, I was the class, like the best kid in the school. You. I had the, the citizen of the year. Why? You never would have thought Yes. That. I was the best kid in the whole school <laughs> at one time because I was well-mannered, I did my work, I didn't say anything. And <clears throat> people want to know where the comedian side came. I can tell you exactly where it came from. Fourth grade in Miss Cleveland's class. Miss Cle I got in trouble for the one few times that I was talking, and Miss Cleveland. I thought you was like had E for. I did, but there was the one few time, one few times I got talk, caught talking, and Miss Cleveland told me, "David, man, get up and get out." And her voice was real crazy, and. I don't know what made me talk just like her. And the class went, I mean, they just started laughing, and so she laughed. And it was just like, I like her.
like this, that kind of put me on the road to like, I want to make people happy. I want to bring joy to make people. Make people laugh. Yeah. And that's why she married me. Yep. Not for that's my good looks, just because I made her laugh. She had other choices. Exactly. You had other choices, right? Possibly. But see, I made her laugh, and I, <laughs> so I got her. David and I met um, from, my best friend actually went to high school with him. They had a chorus class together. And of course, we sang together in our church choir, me and my friend Nicole. and. He was singing. I sang with two other guys who were pretty good. We were city famous. They were. <laughs> you ever seen somebody that's city famous? We were city famous, buddy. We were city famous. So we were known all around, around the, city. the town. This is right there in our area. So, so my best friend told them, because, you know, they were singing and they were really good. I have to give it to them. They, the guys were really good. We were great. And, city famous. Okay. Keep that so. In mind. Nicole told them, well, I know someone who can sing better than y'all. And they was like, really? Bring her on. So she took me, brought me, her grandmother to brought us school, to that our high school. school. Now, our high school was known for, like, Like singers. music, for, new, I mean, for we, music. I mean, we could sing any style of music. So bringing somebody to come sing was like, yeah. Yeah, like they you know, won all the trophies Mind you, we're everything. city famous, and our school is... City famous too. Okay, yeah. well, well, okay. Okay, we get that you're city famous. Our school was too. Oh, city you're, you're, you're okay. <laughs> so she, we, I went and I sang for them, and they were pretty impressed. But I wasn't really into the competing thing. You no. know, it was like. Okay, mind you, I told you our I, school was really good, so we were used to really good singers. This wasn't a really good singer. So this what was a great singer. <laughs> it was like, oh, and it was three of us. So she out sang all three of us together. And it was like, all right, she can really sing. So that's kind of how it, it took off from there, us meeting and so happened that same weekend. I had to sing that actually, it was a Friday. I remember it to this day. And I said, well, I'm singing as a special guest for this choir musical. So y'all come by and hear me. So a couple of them, his friend, him and another friend came, another guy that sings with him came and then Later that same weekend, like that Saturday, I ran into them. Now, just at so a, happened, we started at bumping another, in each other. At another musical. So I was like, but I finally got to hear the group, the three of them. Their name was the Humble, the humble Hearts. Hearts. So I finally so got humble. to hear them. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. They were some <laughs> bad guys. But they had a beautiful voice, and they did love singing for the Lord. I, I can give them that. We were humble. <laughs> and that is so funny. Did I say we were city famous? No, yeah, okay. babe. <laughs> How are you going to be famous so, in the city? So that's how, that's really how we met. And eventually, I started singing with him and the guys. Well, we kind of, I don't want to say tricked her, but we kind of just kind of, like, had her to come to our rehearsal and say, hey, well, why don't you sing this part, and we'll do the background to it. And before you know it, she had learned the whole song. So, well, why don't you come and sing with us? She killed the song, oh, and we okay. started teaching her other songs from our set. And she was singing with a real popular group. But actually, it was the, coming to an end, the other group. So once they asked me, I was like, okay, sure. So I started singing with them. I'm glad that group stopped. I'm glad it did, too. Because <laughs> it kept going with us. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to get... Look at that style. I'm glad you made the choice. I, and I lived um, with it. Yes, I'm glad you asked me. <laughs> and it's been 30 years later. 30 years later. One of the first things we just decided is like, divorce is not going to be an option for right. us. Exactly. We're going to work through Whatever. everything. Any marriage, I mean, you're going to have some challenges, but you have to make up in your mind that you love each other enough that you're willing to fight for each other. And just like the scripture says, love covers a multitude of fault. I mean, because you're not going to always do everything right. It's like learning to get to know each other, to really learn that it's going to be you and me against this world. Happiness is doable. You just got to work at it. Kirk and I went to high school together. He, so we, he was a part of the Humble the, Hearts. The, the, the three. So with Kirk, uh, we sang in high school, and Kirk went off to do, uh, to so be with another choir, choir called DFW Mass. Mm -hmm. But when, once he was going with DFW Mass and kind of gained some popularity, he came back and he wanted to put together a group. From our area. From from, he took singers from Dallas and Fort Worth and put them together to form Kirk Franklin and the, and family. the family. And so he came to me and said, hey man, putting together this group, would you be interested? I said, yeah, you think Tam will be interested? I said, I don't know, let me ask you. Tam, would you want to sing with the family? 
I don't know. <laughs> Maybe so. I don't know. <laughs> this dude here. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. Maybe we'll do. And I convinced her to sing with the family, and it was the best decision that we ever made for Because our we, you know, singing was our passion. It was our heart. I mean, we were really into this thing. I mean, so bad to the fact that when we were in the Humble Hearts, one of Daryl, which is our pastor now, he used to steal his mom's car this for, us to, we were. for us to go sing at a church event. So, cause sometimes he was like, "How screwed up is that?" I know, but we wouldn't like we were going to the club. We were going to church. How do you tell somebody, officer? I stole my mom's car. Where are you going? To, to church. church. So, once we kept going and we started Kirk Franklin and the family, and we were singing with the family for like eight, nine, almost nine years. That came to an end, and then we met Tyler, Tyler Perry. Perry. I went to audition for. Uh, up and coming producer director, Which was nobody sick. knew who he was. Uh, I walked in the room, and this tall figure of a guy with this huge head was standing Why would there. You keep, stop saying that. He has a big head. But if you don't have to say it. People notice, you know. You think he's gonna be upset when he find out I called his head big? Well, you've told him before, so it's not like he doesn't. I know. didn't say it. I said it but, to. Him. Yeah, but we met him, and that turned out. It just, the Lord just kept elevating us. That turned out to be one of the best yeah. moves that we could have ever made. Right. Because that, you know, those characters became house, like they were in everybody's house. Everybody had an aunt that reminded them of Maria or a, Miss, a, a, a Cora, Cora or Mr. Brown or, or, or uncle. It reminded them of Mr. Brown. And it was just like, we really, we were having fun on the road. It had no, I had, we had no idea that it would take off. Tyler didn't even know that it would take off like no. it did, but the Lord just blessed it, and the people just embraced a, us. And now, in the movies and then the television shows and reality, reality shows, reality shows from to the man to yeah. me becoming an artist. A singer. Grammy and, Award winner. Oh, well, she doesn't like when I yeah, say that I just, kind of stuff. A lot of people don't even know. And this is to just show people our time is not God's time. Tamala didn't start her solo career until she was 38 years old. Like in the music industry, that's kind of like. Unheard of. You should be about to retire now. But unheard to of. get started as a solo, as a new artist, and start from ground zero at 38, it's unheard of. And to go from being that age, I won't say that old, that age, to being at the top of, of the genre, it's unheard of. I mean, you know, people start in their 20s. Kirk started, I think he was 19 or 20, 20-something. Mm -hmm. 20 but to start as a solo at 38. I know it was, just, it was just a favor of God. I'm just so happy to be singing. I'm just, I'm not going to cry, but I'm just so happy to be able to share my gift. And to be where we are today, we take no credit. All glory goes to God. And we just like to make people happy and, and also give hope and inspiration that really kind of brings us to where we are now of sharing yeah. about Jesus Calling. Our first experience Jesus Calling is at a truck stop. I think it was on tour. I like was on the truck stop and I've purchased either them from um, um, Cracker Barrel or at a truck stop, and I've bought like, so many, and he bought so many. Yeah, you, that, and the thing is, you don't, you're on tour, you stop to go get restroom break or get something to eat, yep. and they have this carousel of, mm -hmm. and you just grab Books. one. What is this about, I've, this Jesus calling? But the, the majority that I've purchased is from just traveling and being on tour. So it's just been it's just been a wonderful thing to get some it's like easy read and you just get some great encouragement and uplifting. This is practical cuz a lot of times you know we get preachy and the Lord told me to tell you right cuz the problem is sometimes we don't get how to apply my biblical to my practical. This gives you some practical practical things like I can take home. Oh, okay, I can do that. I can you know I can handle that. And that's what but that's what reading these. I even bought audio book. I have audio books too, so I like to listen to them read while I'm in the office. 
And I told her the other day, I'm going to turn it on to the yes, audio book. Yes, good. Now. But I encourage anyone, if you see it, pick you up, pick you up a copy. It's or two. A, I try to make it my part every day to at least get up and constantly, first of all, thank him. Mm-hmm. And I thank him throughout the day for just, first of all, just the day that he's given. And, again, another opportunity that I can, it's always about a share. It's always about a word of, of, of encouragement. And that's, to me, how I stay grounded, even if it's just a smile, if we go to the gym mm-hmm. and tell somebody, how you doing? Hey, it's going to be a good day today. Have a blessed day. And I told the lady, it's so funny, the other day in the store, I say, have a blessed day. And she looked at me and she was like, yes. Sometimes I mean, that's like, all people need to hear. So. You know, in, in our industry, <clears throat> you know, we can't go on a movie set the Lord told me to tell you. and the, the, Sometime they just need to see a consistent person that's living out what they're talking about. They just need, they don't need to see perfect people. They need to see consistent. People won't judge you on your perfection. They'll judge you on your consistency. And that's what we try to give every day. People that, that's with us know that our Lord and Savior is our priority. Yes. If you... They know that some way, somehow, we're going to sneak Jesus in there. Yep. Even if you tell us not to, it's going to be, yeah, yep. you know, and I was thinking about Jesus, Jesus the other day. Mm-hmm. We're going to put it in there, and we just want to let people know there is still hope. Yep. Our Savior still lives. Wow. And to just be sitting here right now is just, I'm kind of overwhelmed because he could have chose anybody. You know, and it's just to, and he, to be but he able put to put us let, together. And to let people know that it can happen, it can happen for you. For whatever that desire or goal or gift or talent that you have, it can be reached. Because with him all things are possible. Our mission is to just let people know that there is hope. Because mm-hmm. we're in a time when people are kind of, it seem it seem hopeless. Like yeah. we're not gonna make it. It's like no, we're screaming out all the time, yes. Yes, we, we are. are. We I mean, are. We are. And by gonna faith, make it. I'm going to make it all the way. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep, the world is going to keep revolving until he comes back. To keep up with David and Tamala's latest projects, including their book, Us Against the World, Our Secrets to Love, Marriage, and Family, please be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. If you'd like to hear more stories about finding hope when all seems lost, check out our interview with author and pastor Craig Grishel. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with Army veteran and Dragon Boat Racing champion, Jessica Key. Growing up on the island of Oahu, Jessica lived in an unstable home that gave her deep trauma from the time she was a toddler. As she grew older, Jessica chafed under authority and struggled to find purpose until she found a family and a sense of duty in the military. The Army changed my life. I had so much gratitude and thankfulness. I was fully motivated fully dedicated. I highly respected and honored my authority and just enjoyed every aspect of it. So given what the Army has done for my life, I I was all in. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel, on IGTV, or on JesusCalling.com slash video.